Of course, it's not sustainable. And people read economics upside down many times. And they then begin to give you uh, deficit ratios from this part of the world, what has been considered sustainable. But those guys know they're producing. They know they can project where the production will lead them to. And so this kind of... <clears throat> the ultimate deficit country is America. But it's the ultimate production machine. So to say, okay, America has this deficit, so our own is not so bad. Shows you are mental. You don't understand economics. Because America can afford that deficit. But we cannot. Even America gets hurt by that deficit. But they can afford it. Because their production machine will rev up. <sighs> no, ours is not sustainable. Now, if you look at what even is more troubling, which is why in those days they talk about IMF conditionalities. We want to borrow, we want to borrow. Oh, things are difficult. Have you watched the behavior of Nigerian politicians? Is there any suggestion that they are doing anything to tighten belts? I wouldn't trust people who behave like that with borrowed money. They will just squash the future of people who will pay back that debt. We have made these mistakes again and again. Again, I, and I say this part of my continuing fighting with uh, President Obasanjo, in spite of the fact that I have a lot of regard for what he has done in, in many areas. Uh, President Obasanjo, with a swagger, paid off Nigeria's debts. I was depressed. It's nice to be debt free, and I would like to achieve that. We had reached Naples terms agreements, which would have enabled us to pay off that debt quietly, without any problem, it was sustainable on those arrangements, and we could have taken the kind of cash flow that was coming in, provided us as counterpart funding for what is going to be significantly private capital to create markets and trigger what is today being referred to as the prosperity paradox of private capital building infrastructure that will drive sustainable growth. But you know, I am Patrick Tommy. I am a terrorist. <laughs> you know, I was told though, I don't know what I, I was told that when a passenger was president, Sometimes in cabinet, he would say, you know, there are terrorists everywhere. In Iran, in Iraq, and at the Lagos Business School. <laughs> so, they didn't listen to me then. Who, who is to say they will listen to me now? Still, they still my life. So, looking at this FUS subsidy saga, you see, these are very nuanced conversation. It's not as simple as remove, take, don't remove. If you remove this subsidy, which don't make sense, by the way, subsidies don't make sense. You're just shortchanging yourself in other ways. But if you remove them with politicians I've just described, who you just see new cash to spend, you will probably do more damage than anything else. I have said repeatedly that, you know, uh, when you're a lame duck government, your time is about to expire and you may be suspended expected to have ambitions of taking some monies away before you go. You usually make very few decisions. I've seen lame dog governments around the world. I've never seen one worse than the present. Buhari's government became lame dog two and a half years to the end of his time because of the way that they've managed the country. And so there's no trust for it. There's a huge trust deficit between the Nigerian people and the government. To make that kind of policy decision is crazy because people can't trust them to use those resources well. 
um, and to then go and borrow in the stead of that removal is even doubly dangerous. So this is the dilemma of where Nigeria is. So what we actually need right now is a government of national unity to allow Nigeria to function because the Buhari government has run out of legitimacy on the one hand and there's too much time still left. How we'll do it, I don't know. Some way we are suggesting maybe that they have to put some conditions in place before the final removal and ensure that there is adequate uh, domestic production of uh, uh, How are they going to do that? How are they going to do that? How are they going to do that? I mean, Nigeria's import list is dominated right now by the two things Nigeria should be exporting the most, petrol and food. How does the country arrive there? Can produce food because there's so much violence. People can't go to their farms. You can't export petrol, which we should have been exporting from 30 years ago, <laughs> but to import it so that our friends can play games and make a lot of money from selling petrol. I guess history will be hard to write. Look. Uh, yeah, I think I have this book here, this lady's book. Let me see if I can find something. Uh, Irene Son, The Next Factory of the World, talking about uh, Chinese investment in the reshaping of Africa. And there's a, there's a quote that I, I like, if you don't mind, if I can find that page here. So, and, um, but you see, I've been saying the same thing, so, but you know, is Patu Tommy, so who cares? <laughs> but let me see the way she put it here. Um, hmm, uh, with the help of foreign investments, favorable national policies, East Asian textile production shot up astronomically. For example, from 1968 to 73, South Korean textile and clothing output grew by an average of 26% a year and exports grew by an astonishing 47% a year. A domestic industry plagued by macroeconomic shocks, a corrupt and inept national government, and foreign competitors that learned to make products cheaply and efficiently combined to create conditions ripe for an insidious development, development smuggling. In 1977, Desperate to resolve the already struggling industry, to de desperate to revive the already struggling industry, this textile industry, the Nigerian government replaced the tariff system with an outright ban on textile imports. But the price differential between Asian and Nigerian textiles was already so high that smugglers could ship in the cheaper Asian textiles, pay off customs officials, sell at a lower price than what domestic firms could afford to produce at and still make a handsome profit. That's how the biggest employer of labor in Nigeria, the textile industry outside of government, was killed. Uh, but notice the, the combination of incompetent government, inept government. Look, in, 19, in 2003, two Columbia University economists, a Spanish uh, originating one called Salah e. Martin and Subramanian wrote an IMF working paper which they said that Nigeria would have been better off without a government. So if you just took Nigeria's oil revenues and just distributed them to Nigerians on the streets, their own share of it, the welfare consequence for the Nigerian people would have been much higher than with the government Nigeria had. So this is a tragedy that we come to the table with. And, and, and that's where we are in looking at the choices that you are, you are raising today.